Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, because I think there's lots of interesting things to talk about. And, uh, but, and, and in order to be brief and cover a fair amount of ground, I'll be really brief. So l let me just launch in. Um, I wrote a book. Oh, this is very interesting. Maybe, oh, I see. Maybe I ought to put it on, hang on. Give me one second here. That's not the mouse, though. All right. Oh, here we go. OK. Lovely. I wrote this book that Ray referred to. It was a, uh, it came out of the work that I did with a, um, an entity called the Commission on Growth and Development. I've spent the last seven or eight years of my life trying to be in and around the developing countries, some very successful, growing at un unprecedented speed, some, you know, still struggling. Um, trying to be helpful, trying to understand that commission was put together mainly to try to figure out what did we learn from a lot of very good academic work, including a good chunk of it from the gentleman on my left here, um, on things that relate to corruption and governance and so on. What did we learn from all of that and from experience, you know, from the trial and error process in developing countries? And, and, and we tried to summarize that. We knew it was an interim report. We knew, you know, if we went out 10 years, we'd you know, find a different set of things. We'll presumably know, have learned some lessons uh, as we go along. Uh, I've also tried to stay involved with the, geez, come here, Mike. Um, I've done two things since the Growth Commission ended, um, and I tried to capture some of this in the second half of the book. Um, I've worked with a number of countries, in particular China, um, on policy issues that they think are challenging. The most recent round of that uh, was actually um, a set of inputs trying to provide some international experience prior to the writing of the 12th five-year plan, which is the sort of operating game plan that China is under now in its first year. And it is the game plan that the new leadership will take over in uh, a few months. Um, and, this is a, and, 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 and this is the first time, as far as I'm aware, that the Chinese um, authorities decided that after the work was done, and the 12th five year, five-year plan was put together, they would publish what the foreigners, that's us, said to them that was supposed to be helpful in putting the 12th five-year plan together. So this is in Chinese. It's a gigantic book. Uh, but this basically is what all of these experts um, had to say that was meant to be helpful in the Chinese um, formulating this. I, I should say, I, I think most of you know, China's in the midst of the, probably the most complicated set of transitions that developing countries go through called the middle income transition. And it's never been done at this scale. And most countries uh, don't navigate through this period without a major growth slowdown. So that's not pessimistic on China. I tend to be the opposite uh, relative to most people, but because it's an enormously talented, complicated, I mean complex uh, set of processes they go through to get this done. But anyway, it's a major challenge. Um, just going back, and, and then I turned my attention to something that uh, I'll talk briefly about before I get to Europe uh, at the end. And that is, I think there are real challenges now as you look forward uh, in the advanced countries, sort of adjustments and structural changes that we're going to need to make to take care of what look to be, to be distributional effects. So let me, and, and then I'll, because I'm sure somebody's interested, and I live in Italy, you'd probably like to know something about what's going to happen there. So let me keep going. I, I'm, uh, I'm having a little trouble, for, you know, figuring out what's frontwards here. So the book starts with what, uh, or tries to start with what I think of as my favorite graph. And this is Bob Fogel's famous 1989 paper um, on what's happened in the global economy. And the story that is, is fairly simple, I think. And that is, you know, from Angus Madison and others, we know that growth was really not part of the global economy for a thousand years before the British Industrial Revolution. In the Ming Dynasty, China was slightly richer than Europe. Uh, but on the whole, in most countries, almost everybody was poor. And there were a few rich, powerful people and a, sl a small commercial class. Uh, and there wasn't much growth. Uh, and then that changed dramatically. And, and, uh, and it wasn't my purpose. Thousands of books have been written about what happened uh, in the British Industrial Revolution. Uh, and I didn't try to kind of contribute to that literature. But what, what actually happened, uh, if you accept that it, so this was a major change, 
in direction and, and rate of change is that Britain, continental Europe with a lag, and then the, uh, what's called the, uh, the European offshoots, that would be us and Canada and Australia and New Zealand started to grow. And that was about 15% of the world's population. And the other 85% more or less stayed exactly where they were. I mean, there were, you know, there were effects. There was railways and there were a few cars and so on. But in terms of standard of living and per capita incomes, nothing much changed. And that went on for 200 years. And so at the end of World War II, you had a world, you know, the one I was born into. Um, it was quite a long time ago. Um, but it wasn't 1908. Uh, they, they, we had a world in which this, this divergence, which was a result of what we would now think of as relatively slow growth, was enormous. I mean, 50 times in terms of income and wealth and so on. And then, though you couldn't see it at the time, that pattern changed in the post-war period. And it was the result, really, of, I think, three things. The people in charge of the global economy, many of them Americans, because we were dominant at that point, decided not to repeat the mistakes of the post-World War I period. Van you know, destroy the vanquished, push them, crush them, creating the environment of the Great Depression and the hyperinflation in Germany and eventually a Second World War. They did the opposite. They set out to open up the global economy to rebuild the vanquished and so on. And almost by accident, they included what were then referred to as backward countries in this. And, and so that was step one. Step two was the colonial empires fell apart. And so all the built-in asymmetries in terms of economic function and role that are inherent in a colonial structure, you know, where they sort of do agriculture and you know, make spices and so on, and other things go on in other countries, that went away. Uh, and, the, and the third thing, of course, is technology. You know, so you have waves of technology and sort of logistics, transportation, communication, and so on. We're living in one of them right now uh, that provided, in some sense, the enabling, underpinning infrastructure to create a global economy. And then very slowly and in a way that was hard to see, the developing countries grew. So the first part of this book is an attempt to understand how that growth dynamic works, you know, based on academic research and, and actually watching it. And what is it that governments do? What is their role? What is it? I mean, most people would agree now, after lots of experiments with central planning, that you know this doesn't this works because of the the <coughs> dynamic version of market incentives and so on, what Schumpeter called creative destruction, uh, and then governments have important roles because these are economies that are building themselves in multiple dimensions in productive capacity, in human capital, in institutional capability, in lots of things. Uh, <clears throat> and you can't simply say at the start you need this, that, and the other thing because they don't have it, right? So there's something more complicated and interactive that's going on. <clears throat> if I had to summarize this, it's kind of the first half of the book, I would say the global economy is crucial and it provides two things. One, there's a huge knowledge and, and technology gap that's the result of this 200 years. That gap starts to close via technology transfer. In all the successful cases that we know of of sustained high growth, this is a, an important feature of it. So we know, we know now as a result of the work of the people who came after Bob Solo, you know, the endogenous growth theory people, Paul Romer, Bob Lucas, Philippe Aguillot, we know how advanced countries grow. Bob Solo told us that you grow in the end because of innovation and technical change. You can't deepen the capital in base of an economy indefinitely. We just didn't, so what the endogenous growth theorists did is they said, okay, we're going to figure out what the incentives are to generate the knowledge base that keeps expanding that makes the economy's total factor productivity higher. And then that just transfers to developing countries, but they don't have to develop it all, you know, collectively. They can import it for a while with this gap that's big. And that really, more than anything else, when it's working, uh, is the explanation for why you can see 7 to 10 percent growth rates for 25 years or more, which is you, which you've seen for the first time ever. Uh, and the fastest and largest of those is China. China's been growing for about 10 percent a year in real terms for over 31 years now, since the reforms in 1978. There's a lot more to it than that. These are high investment, high savings environments. And by high, I mean north of 25 percent, probably more like 30 percent of the national GDP, national output or income. 
that's just a number to most of us. But if you're a poor country and your per capita income is $400 a person, 30% of that's a lot of money you're not spending on yourself today or your family, but investing so that your children and grandchildren are going to be better off than you are because of the high growth. It's an extraordinary intertemporal trade-off that gets made when this engine is running. And it's not clear why it gets made in some places rather than others. So there's a lot of, a lot of it that sort of deals with kind of that sort of dynamic. But let me push on. Um, this just tells you, uh, in, is a graph that I like because it's a, it's a little technical. But you can measure inequality in a variety of ways, and economists do. And if you <coughs> measured inequality over a long period of time, and, and asked what fraction of the inequality, income inequality, was attributable to differences between countries as opposed to differences among people within countries. What this graph is, is, it tells you is what fraction of that measured inequality was accounted for by differences between countries. And what you can see is shortly after the British Industrial Revolution started, most of the inequality right, was, was uh, differences within countries. There weren't that many big differences between among countries. And this number rose and rose and rose and rose. It's just a different way of saying that this divergence took place. And you can see it's flattening out. And it's going to start to come down. I mean, in 50 years, the two economic giants in the global economy are going to be China and India. Uh, and they're, you know, roughly 85% of the world's population is going to live in what we now call an advanced um, economy. It's a completely different world. And we're, and the story of this book is I'm giving you, or trying to give you, my best interim report at year 60 of this 100-year journey that we're on. And then the rest of the book is an attempt to talk about the second half is, this, is the part of that journey we haven't taken. And what is it that we're going to have to deal with on the way? Can we take an economy at 60, a global economy at 60 trillion and blow it up to three times that amount in the next 25 years, which is what's going to happen, and have an adequate natural resource base and an environment we can live with? Or if the answer to that is maybe yes, then what do we got to do to get there? And who has to do it? Uh, and so on. There are lots of questions. How do we govern this thing with diverse nations and so on? I, these are, I mean, I think Dan Gross was saying, I wanted to raise these questions in a way that made it possible to start thinking about it. I, I didn't pretend um, to have answers. I think that would have been arrogant in the extreme. <clears throat> this is just a picture of what high growth looks like. This is actually both China and India. Um, so, and they're, they're interesting because they're both succeeding. Their governance structures are completely different. Uh, India was a bit slower to accelerate. China sort of jumped into high growth mode almost instantaneously in 1978. Interestingly, not initially because of the opening up, uh, but because they introduced market incentives in the agricultural sector. They ba basically, what the authorities did sequentially, they tried it as an experiment first. Um, that sounds like a throwaway line, but a lot of policy setting in these countries is experimenting, because you don't actually know what's going to happen. So you try it out. But anyway, it tried, they tried it out and it worked. And basically what they said was, if you can produce more than the quota under the centrally planned system, you can sell the difference. Well, the agricultural output just exploded. And so did the prices, by the way. <laughs> and the 18% who weren't in the agricultural sector were not enthusiastic about this reform um, because prices were going up for the things that they spent most of their money on. Um, but it worked. I mean, it worked beautifully. And, and it worked in two dimensions. It produced an enormous amount of growth and increases in income and wealth. But it also did it for 85% of the population. So if my, the commissioners, these um, political and policy leaders that I had the privilege to work with, where, you know, where, that I learned so much from, Ray, if they were here, they'd say, this, this thing, which is most people benefit in some way or other, that they chose to call inclusiveness following the Indian lead. The Indian, inclusiveness is the Indian term for social cohesion, or what in America we call a social contract. And, and it's uh, pretty much been adopted all over the developing world um, in the last 10 years. This is cru 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 crucial. This is not an add-on to a growth strategy. This is a core of a growth strategy. Or to put that in the negative, if you fail in a major way, on the inclusion 
dimension of this, uh, then something bad will happen. It's sometimes conflict. It's sometimes an abandonment of the policies that lead to the high growth, uh, polarizing shifts in government, you know, from populist to the reverse and back and forth, which you see in Latin America uh, historically, much less now, because uh, Brazil is one of the countries that's re-accelerated. Brazil's an interesting case. I'll just take one second on it. Brazil is a high growth country by this very high standard of more than 7% for 25 years or more after World War II. And in 1975, it stopped, literally stopped, uh, in per capita income growth for 25 years. And there's lots of reasons for that. They had dictatorships. They had hyperinflation. They lost control of the macro economy. They turned inward and adopted a kind of import substitution policy, which we know doesn't work in the long run, but works for a while. Um, just everything went wrong. And then under a sequence of leaders, starting with um, Cardoso and then Lula da Silva and the current administration, they are re-accelerating. So this is one of the you know, bright stars in the developing world again. It's quite an extraordinary history. You don't see that very often. Um, and, what, and this funny looking line up here, India is about 13 years behind China. If you want to guess at what's going to happen in India and you don't, you're not a contrarian, just drop back 13 years in Chinese you know, sort of growth dynamics and follow the line displaced over. Um, now I'm going to shift gears. Um, I think I'm going to do this first. So uh, one of the things that I think we're going to have to deal with is the fact that the global economy structure is shifting pretty rapidly. And the, advanced, the emerging economies are are now quite big. They're within shooting distance of passing 50% of global GDP at the current exchange rates. They're already well past with, with purchasing power parity adjustments. And they're, st and they're moving up the value added chains. And I mean, China's obviously at the core of this because it is so large. And part of the middle income transition is moving into different activities. Justin Lin at the World Bank, who may have been with you at some point, estimates there's a minimum of 85 million jobs the China in the labor-intensive, process-oriented, tradable sector of the economy. You would think exports. You know, if you come to my class, I'll teach you to think tradable. <laughs> um, but that are going to be exported to countries in the earlier stages of growth. It's just a massive opportunity for the countries that have thought they were competing with China. Because China's going to do what Japan and Korea and Taiwan and everybody else did before, and that is exit and move up into higher value added activities with a deeper human capital and knowledge base. And so the, the economy structure is changing very fast. And they are starting to compete. They're moving in the direction of increasing their productivity and capability and competitiveness and, and relative comparative advantage and things that are closer to what we do. Paul Samuelson wrote his last major paper in the Journal of Economic Literature on this subject. He was really angry with a number of economists, his fellow economists, because we kept saying, you know, this globalization and trade benefits everybody. And he, he knew it wasn't true, logically, in theory. And he wrote a paper that is stylized the way all models are. But basically what it says is if, the, if a developing country or a country that has some of those characteristics increases dramatically its productivity, in the area in which the advanced countries have a comparative advantage, then the advanced countries can actually lose. Not just because you take the economic activity away, but because the relative price movements. And it's just, I think it's an important paper. Not, and it's been criticized because it's stylized and so on. And you can debate about this. But the idea, I think, is important. So, so very briefly. We just had a huge shock. Um, and uh, I think what we did is respond to it pretty well. Um, and we got through it in about an eight month period. So the shock, the big shock, came in September of 2008. By April of 2009, the financial market stabilized. And then I think we made a major mistake, which is we thought having, you know, had a heart attack and survived that we were now going to have a difficult but you know, relatively normal recovery. And a number of people, including my friends at PIMCO, said, no, this is not right. 
you know, this will A, take longer, and B, it's a new normal. We're not going back where we were because we were growing in an unbalanced fashion that we couldn't keep up, hence the term new normal. That was largely ignored by markets and I think by policymakers. I mean, you know, it's easy to, you know, back, you know, Monday morning quarterback, so I don't mean, I don't mean this to sound excessively criti critical, but we underestimated the extent to which there'd be a drag on growth and employment. We, over there, we underestimated the seriousness of the deficits because of underestimating, I mean, overestimating growth, speed of recovery. A lot of bad things happened. Then the Reinhardt Rogoff book came out and said, you know what, <laughs> when, you have a, when you have a shock that has a balance sheet component like that, this always happens, you know, every time for 800 years. So then people started to believe it, and the expectations are clearly sort of coming down. Um, in America, we had a leveraged asset bubble, and we transferred a lot of the leverage to the public sector and are now dealing with that. In much of Europe, they just leveraged up the, uh, the public sector, you know, and skipped the intermediate step. Th th it varies from country to country. In the UK and, S and Spain look more like us. Most of the rest that are in trouble, you know, just did it directly. They skipped the, you know, the private sector leverage. And so this is a picture which is a little hard to read, but basically, these little funny looking lines up there are the recoveries in employment fall from the point that a downturn occurs. So that goes down and then comes back up. And, and if you could get the dates on these things right, what you would see is that these recoveries, so-called recoveries, are getting longer. And, and the big dark line is the one we're in. So we're, we're not anywhere near back to where we wanted to be. And in fact, we have unemployment stuck at 7, 9%. And, uh, and if you add in people who gave up and people who are underemployed, it's probably more like 17 or 18%, I would guess. What I'm trying to do in this discussion is suggest there's a structural component to this. Now, I don't have time to argue that tonight, but let me show you what convinced me of it. So with uh, my research associate, very talented South African woman named Sandy Lay Plotschweil. I mean, she can't pronounce her last name, so I don't see why I should be able to. And uh, we went back 18 years in American economy, industry by industry, looking at where employment was generated and where we grew, where we generated value added. Value added because it adds up to GDP if you do it right. And we divided the, our economy into the part that trades with, competes with the rest of the world, uh, and the part that, you know, the very large part, I might add. I mean, most people are not used to this, but about 70% of a major industrial uh, economy, like the American one, is non tradable. It includes government, most of healthcare, retail, construction. Now, this may change, you know. In 25 years, most construction could be modular, and the modules will be made somewhere else. I mean, it's a moving target. What? As <laughs> we ship them, that's true. Um, and, and this is maybe the most startling result. I mean, we could spend a lot of time looking at graphs, so you can read the papers. Um, we generated almost all of the 27.3 million jobs that we generated over those 18 years, just coming up just before the crisis in the non tradable side. Uh, it's really quite startling. And when you really dig into this, what you discover is that that, I mean, I'll try to tell the story briefly. On the tradable side, a bunch of very competitive sectors that work very well globally, like consulting, finance, managing multinational enterprises, designing computers, like, uh, and, and things like Apple products. Uh, I'm, I'm being facetious, but there's a ton of that. Uh, and they grew. They grew in employment, they grew in value added, they grew in every measure that you can think of. If you look at the manufacturing sectors, that, that is the things that are conventionally defined as manufacturing, which you should know are long, complicated value-added chains, right, with lots of pieces. The lower value-added pieces of those appear to me to be able to have migrated out into the global economy as the rest of the world's capabilities did. So they were competing in those parts of the value-added chain. That employment then disappeared. This would be middle to lower income employment, not the high end in general. And so those people flowed back across the tradable, non-tradable boundary and actually found employment. 
we didn't have an employment problem. When you dig into where those almost 27 million jobs were created in the non-tradable sector, you discover there are 4 million are in government, 6 million are in health care, and a very big chunk were in construction until it turned down in 2006. Retail, the, you know, hotels, hospitality, restaurants, stuff like that. These are the labor-intensive sectors in, in, a, in, in a modern economy. Um, and then you can use your own judgment about whether that was a sustainable path. But I don't think, I mean, I've thought a lot about it, and I don't think it is. And so we have uh, a pattern where I think it's not going to get reproduced over time. But you can have big arguments about this. W one way of calibrating your assessment is to look at another economy. So we did that too. Um, I haven't written this up, but this is the German economy, same data. Uh, for a different period, 95, because we couldn't get the data before that up to the start of the crisis. You should know, I think, that Germany was regarded as the basket case of Europe in 2000. Its productivity was low. Its uh, unemployment was high. It had ingested East Germany at par, meaning you know at a one-to-one -one exchange rate. Um, had huge challenges to their credit. Uh, they decided they had a problem. And so, and, and, and if you poke into it, you know, it's not hard to figure out what the problems were. Very rigid labor markets, you know, couldn't do the kind of dynamics that are associated with uh, adapting to the global economy. Lots of stuff like that. So they went after it. It's not easy to go after this. Uh, I, two weeks ago, I talked to um, Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, who, um, kind of confirmed what it was they had to do. They had to choose between employment and income growth. They had to get the upper end of the income spectrum to agree with to it so that you know it wasn't one group paying the whole price. They had to get the unions to agree to drop the restrictions in return for a promise that they would deliver the employment growth. They had to rebuild the social safety nets and the pension systems and so on. It wasn't easy. My, um, Chancellor Schroeder said somewhat charmingly, well, I lost my job doing this, <laughs> but it took quite a bit of courage to get it done. And this is the result. The, the patterns, when you look at them, are not that different from the American economy. That is, sensible things happen because of comparative advantage in market forces. The lower value-added parts of some of the manufacturing industries go. Automobiles would be a big exception. Um, ours declined and theirs rose. But the patterns are similar, but they're more muted. And so the bottom line is the tradable sector is a, an employment engine in Germany as well as a growth engine. And you can do this for any economy. It's pretty labor intensive stuff. Um, I think I, because you all are an academically oriented, I, I need to tell you there's a huge dispute going on about how much of this is labor saving technology and how much of it is the movement of activity in the global economy. It's not a dispute that's easy to settle because the data that come, industry data on employment and output or value added don't allow you to distinguish, right? You can't tell. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to guess if there's a big shift in capital intensity, but labor saving technology, like a good chunk of information technology, could have caused a fair amount of the problem. And so we're using judgment here, and people's judgments are very different. Uh, I think the right humble thing to say is we don't know. The data you need in order to sort this out is comprehensive data on the supply chains, the global supply chains, dynamically. So you can actually see where the economic activity is located. And you can do that for specific supply chains. I mean, many of us know lots of examples and can figure it out. Uh, but, but you can't generalize until you have them all. And then if you really added them up. And that's kind of on the to-do list, I think, if we're going to take this stuff seriously. In the meantime, I think we have challenges that um, show up in employment now, post-crisis, but also in the income distribution. So one of the effects of having that amount of incremental labor coming into the, the labor market being pushed into the tradable side was there a lot of competition for those jobs. You know, there, there's no buffer on the, on the tradable side. And so the... And, th and that tended to be uh, lower income people. I didn't bring the graph, but if you look at value added per person, 
which is generally fairly highly correlated with income, what you see is on the tradable side, it just shot up. Why? Because value added was growing and employment wasn't, right? On the non-tradable side, you had enough of growth in employment that the value added per person you know, wasn't quite as large. I mean, grew a little bit, right? But not very much because there was a lot of employment. So what, what ha you can see what's going on, I think. The middle and lower income part of the spectrum, you know, middle, lower income in education and other things, was flowing into the non-tradable side competing for the jobs the value added was used up with the incremental employment. And on the tradable side, you know, people like you are doing just fine. And this is the American income distribution over time. Hmm? Flat, yeah. And so, again, there's gaps in this storytelling, but I think it's pretty, pretty clear. And I think some of what you hear when you start listening to the people who are marching up and down 6th Avenue who probably came close to preventing me from being with you tonight. Part of what they're saying is there's something wrong uh, with this. There's a lot more to this. I mean, I've been asked and have started to ask myself the question, you know, what is it that you could do to, to mitigate, if not eliminate, some of these very powerful um, impacts of a combination of technology and globalization? I think, you know, when you start thinking carefully about it, then you think about the obvious things. The effectiveness of parts of the education system. You think about skills gaps, which are increasingly well documented, still anecdotal, but a lot of them. I mean, Steve Jobs, you know, before he passed away, told the president that he would have hired 30,000 people in the Apple supply chain if he could have found them, the current president. Uh, and that doesn't mean they weren't going to assemble the things in southern China at Foxconn, but, um, but you know, probably tax reform would help. Certainly building some infrastructure uh, you know, would help, even though honest people would say, we don't know individually in the aggregate what difference these things would make. You know, we're pretty sure that a sensible group of people would say, you know, we ought to do them. Simple truth, to be honest with you is we're in a country that's been over-consuming and under-investing. The Great Depression ended definitively in World War II. And what happened in World War II from an economist's point of view is we had a massive fiscal stimulus, massive. You know, we built the debt to GDP ratio up over 100% very quickly. And we went to people and said, you know what, this is a war. And you're used to consuming at such and such a level and we need some of that income to invest in the war effort. So your consumption levels are going down and the investment's going up. And not only did it end the Great Depression, but it created a, a, a technological base of the economy in the post-war period that we've been living off ever since. Now, a bunch of smart people put that together. You know, the research and sort of structure that's built into the American systems. Uh, and in a way, if you could do that now, you could, you could accelerate what people still call a recovery or this transition to wherever we're going in terms of both speed and quality of outcome. But you've got to do it by investing. And if you don't, then the people who are still employed are hanging on, and the people who are unemployed are paying most of the price, I would guess. And the other people who are paying the price are the next generation. So there's surveys, lots of surveys in America now, that say that for the first time people report that they believe their children and grandchildren, certainly their children, will have less opportunity than they do. They may be wrong, you know, I mean, but they're, they're seeing things in their lives that are not inconsistent with this sort of evolution. All I'm really trying to do is not, I'm certainly not proposing that anybody knows the answer, um, but I sort of think that it's worth trying to start the discussion, even if the politics are locked up a little bit. Let me just go back, and the last thing I'll say, Ray, is um, I live in Europe. So the epicenter of risk in the global economy is, uh, is certainly Europe. If the network structure of the global economy is such that uh, if you start with the emerging markets, they can probably and are now sustaining growth when we're pretty flat in the advanced countries. So that's a degree of decoupling we didn't have even 10 years ago. 
it's not a theoretical proposition, it's an observation, but it's consistent with the notion that they're bigger, they trade more with each other, and they're richer, so the composition, the composition, not the size, of the aggregate demand is a better match for their economies. Their, in, their, their economies don't run through the advanced economies to the same extent. Think of global supply chains. Most people who become aware of them think that this is east to west. Emerging markets make things and we consume them. Well, that's increasingly less accurate picture. Where actually global supply chains look like stuff was made all over the place and, and consumed all over the place as the Chinas and Indias and Brazils get bigger and bigger. And so they would say the major risk is Europe. Why? Because they can sustain the growth if we go flat, but if we go down, and Europe will take America down, given the fragility of our recovery, with a very high probability, they can't make up that aggregate demand. So that'll take them down. America probably, my best guess is in for, uh, if Europe stabilizes, is actually not going to have a downturn. Nobody knows, but that would be my best guess. Because there's lots of elements of strength, and we're just struggling with some of this other stuff, but it's not fatal. But in Europe, there's huge risks. So, and right now, uh, I guess to provoke a discussion, I'll say, I, I have a little framework when looking at countries that, and we could carry out this exercise for a number because everybody has challenges, that, that I summarize as resources, competence, and will. So once you know what the challenges are, you ask the, the question, does the country have the resources if they deploy them? You know, they can be a balance sheets, public sector balance sheets, they can be competitive capabilities or productivity growth, I mean, lots of things. That's what I mean by resources broadly defined. If, if you pass that test, then you have to ask, do the people who are running the show know what they're doing? And that answer varies from country to country and over time. I mean, there's a lot of learning. And then, then obviously, in an environment like the ones we're living in, even if you've got the competence, you, ask, you have to ask a question, Will the political system actually do something? You know, or are you locked up in some sort of, are you dithering? Are you distracted as the Italian government has been? Do you seem to have su such large differences that nothing's going to happen? Which appears to be the case, at least in the short run around here. Nobody thinks much is going to happen on economic policy until the after the election. And then I guess we don't know. In Italy, uh, there's a very serious situation. I mean, roughly speaking, uh, this is an economy where the private investors are, are leaving the sovereign debt market because of perceived risk. And they are therefore driving up the yield. The Italian uh, government has to roll over it. This, the debt is $2.4 trillion. It's the third largest sovereign debt market in the world. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio, the sovereign debt to GDP ratio is 120%. It's the black line on that graph up there. And so if Italy does a whole lot of fiscal consolidation and other stuff, these yield rises undo it, literally overnight. And then it gets worse. And this thing sort of starts to unravel. And so, uh, and if Italy unravels, I think there's a fairly easy to see process of damage to the balance sheets of banks in other countries, the need to use their resources to stabilize their own financial institutions. It's very easy to see a process, not a sure thing, but a process that where the public finances sequentially unravel right through the Eurozone, at least until you get to Germany and maybe even there. So this has to be stopped. Now here's the tricky part. So if you, I don't have time tonight to explain to you why I think Italy has the resources to do it. There's lots of strengths. One big one or two of them are very low debt in the household sector. That's the gray line, the gray part of the line. Extremely low. These people don't use leverage. The Italians also save like the Chinese. So, uh, the savings rate's now about 17% in the household sector. Used to be 30% if you go back 15 years. This is the wealthiest country, as far as we know, per capita among the advanced countries. It's not the highest income by any means, but it's wealthy. So the consolidated balance sheet of, of Italy is very healthy. Consolidated means add up all the debt and add up all the assets. The debt isn't out of line with other countries when you add it up, and the, and the asset side is very large. Uh, and there's lots of dynamic parts of the economy and so on. 
So the question is, do, can, they, can the new government, Mr. Berlusconi, step down? Uh, Mario Monti, who's a highly respected economist, uh, you can read about his background, has put together a new government. Some people say it's too technically competent and too politically naive. We'll see. Um, they're going to probably pass a confidence vote, which puts them in power uh, sometime today, if it hasn't already happened. And the question is, can they put together a reform package that generates growth and brings fiscal stability? I think the answer to that, if you're being honest, is yes. So there are some people who disagree with that. So then you might say, well, then we're out of the woods. We got rid of the dithering government that was distracted, and there's a good one, and they've got a reasonable chance. The problem is they don't have time. So the private sector is not sure that the political system will support the Monty government, so they're not willing to, to place the bet. So they're exiting, and the yields are going out of control. That brings us to the ECB and the lender of last resort. So the ECB, with the backing of the Eurozone core, in principle has the, uh, has the ability, although some people say it's illegal, um, to buy uh, the sovereign debt and put a lid on the yields. The, by the way, the danger zone for the yields is 7%, which is about what they, where they are now. And it, after that, it can spiral out of control really fast, as you saw in the Greek case. Um, <coughs> the, the ECB and the euro core, and particularly the Germans, are reluctant to do this. And they have a reason. They think if they stabilize the, you know, the European yields at 4 to 5 percent, that that'll take the pressure off the government and, that, and increase the likelihood they don't do the reforms because they're out of trouble. So this is a catch-22, right? You know, the, the ECB doesn't want to do this. And, and then, then when we bring in the Italian citizens, there's a lot of Euroskeptics among the Italians, as there are in other countries. And so if this goes on for a while, they say, this enterprise is dumb. You know, let's do what we used to do. You know, we get out of this thing. We used to devalue when we needed to re reset the competitiveness. This is exactly what Greece has to do. Uh, and so this can get out of control. And I think the only answer is what many of our colleagues, including our colleagues here at Columbia are saying is that is that European, the core of Europe has to screw up its courage and make an unconditional commitment, even if, and run the risk that it has adverse incentive effects uh, with respect to the process in Italy. Because if they don't do it, it's very hard to see how you can get this under control. And this, this spiraling out of control on the yield side could get out ahead of the reform process and the ability to demonstrate that it's working. So anyway, that's where the risk lies. And, and it's big. I mean, the Eurozone doesn't survive you know, without the Italy's and the Spain's. I mean, it, you might get a, some silly little version of it. But it's completely different from Greece. I mean, Greece, my colleague Nuriel Rubini is right. I mean, Greece uh, has no future in this Eurozone. They, they, even if they're bailed out with whatever you call it, the default, a haircut, or a bunch of other things. Um, there's no, they're about 40% out of bounds in terms of productivity. And without the exchange rate, you can't reset your terms of trade with the rest of the Europe and the world. And so you have to deflate your way through that. Nobody's ever seen a successful, you know, non-turbulent, politically non-turbulent deflation of that magnitude. So when you interview the people on the streets in, in, in Athens, you know, a typical person will say the, what the future looks like is austerity forever with no future in addition. And, and at some point, if they don't organize an exit, then the chances are pretty good that the, the Greek people will organize an exit and it'll get done, probably in a fairly chaotic way. Now, having said that, I mean, it sounds flippant because it's not easy to do. If you announce this in advance, there'll be a run on the banks, the likes of which you've never seen. So you got to do this sort of like a devaluation, which is to say, no, we'd never do that, and then you do it on Saturday night. <laughs> I mean, right? That, that's the way these things work. Um, but to be honest, Greek doesn't destroy the Euro core. Uh, I think most sensible people now think if this enterprise is going to survive, this kind of problem in, the, in, in Italy has to be solved. And, uh, 
and the euro the, the, that has to shrink to countries that you know where where the resources are there and they can stabilize and, and, and where you can reasonably argue that their best future is to stay in if there's enough cooperation. But that's kind of where we are. I mean, this is pretty high risk in moment. Why don't I shut up? Um, I've talked too long, but questions? Yes, sir. So like in a political vacuum, doesn't it sound reasonable that Italy, given the household wealth, uh, that the government just cuts entitlements extremely since they, the households could afford it since they have no leverage and massive savings? They're more likely. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the right direction, but what they're talking about now is something that may shock you because th they like some of the entitlements. The healthcare system in most of the country works very well. It's a state centered system. I can testify to that, you know, and I, I live there. Um, so, what they're more likely to do is have uh, a tax on wealth. So, people, if they're given a choice, they'll say, if you have to take down the the net liabilities, then use the balance sheet, but don't muck around with a system that works that we all like. And indeed, you know, there are people, I mean, it's analogous to what Warren Buffett says here, uh, when he says we should be had tax the high income component at a higher rate. I'm not saying there's a groundswell of support for that here, but, um, but the Italians, you know, are talking about the fact that a properly constructed, reasonably fair, you know, Wealth tax might be an important part of the solution to that. They do own, see Ray. Yeah, Ray has to go to a, <clears throat> a contentious appointment the committee meeting, um, where where his input's crucial. So he told me in advance. So I think there's they're going to consider that they also own assets they can privatize. You know, nothing like what China owns, but. Hmm? Yeah, and they're expecting to do that. So that's certainly on the agenda. The harder part, the one that may fail politically, is there's um, lots of labor market rigidities. In the, the public sector unions are extremely powerful, and they can bring the country to a halt. Mario Monti was the commissioner for competition, you know, what we would call antitrust in America, for the European Commission. So he knows there's lots of places where we could be more productive and more competitive, uh, where we actually protect people from competition now. So that would be a component of it. Um, the, the, what I think many people who know the country well know is the North is extremely healthy, dynamic economy. It looks, it feels, looks and feels and acts more like the, some combination of Switzerland and Germany. Uh, and so if that, you know, continues and gets deployed, the pessimists look at it and they say, well, they have low growth. You know, over a fairly extended period and, and especially their growth has been extremely poor after the after the crisis. The low growth before that was this is an economy that was really making big structural adjustments to the euro. I mean, you have to know a fair amount of economic history, but they were devaluing. And as a result of that, periodically, in the pre-euro era, then the effect of that was to give them an economic structure with lots of medium-sized <coughs> businesses that survived because the devaluation took the competitive pressure off. And the euro took away that, you know, you can't do that. In, in a eurozone, there's nothing to devalue with, and Mr. Trichet certainly wasn't interested in anything like that, and so, so the Italian structure, the the microeconomic structure of the economy has been adjusted with negative effects on growth. Post the crisis, every country, mostly on autopilot, had a big stimulus. By autopilot, I mean not because we did it on purpose, but because the revenues fell and the unemployment insurance claims rose and a whole bunch of other stuff. And Italy actually, because of the 120% debt to GDP ratio, couldn't and didn't do that. This was actually an act of responsibility on the part of the, of mostly Tremonti, the finance and economy minister in the Berlusconi government. So he knew we couldn't do that. So we actually had a, a weapon that most other countries had, at least to some extent, that, that, that we didn't have and, and couldn't use without jeopardizing the fiscal stability of the place. So he clamped down on these deficits. And as a result, he killed whatever growth might have come from that sort of auto, you know, automatic stabilizer type stimulus. And that explains a fair amount of the relatively poor performance in terms of growth compared with the other European countries or the US. <laughs>
Yeah, Alan. Yeah, a little so bit. How do we, you know, incentivize, you know, as, as, as you know, you were saying about the healthcare and you know, making some stress, you know, tradable and not tradable. So the, I think the outlook for tradable and not tradable, you know, for a company you just buy one. You know, yeah. you can't buy a country at this point. So Well this is complicated, but let me give you an example. A multinational corporations you know, are doing very well. They operate all over the global economy. And they look around and ask, where are the markets and where are the resources? And where should I put various pieces of this thing? That They're the concert masters. You know, that, you know, when you say there's a global economy that's moving around, there's a bunch of people doing it. And, th and that's who these people are. They're not all based here. You know, there's Chinese ones and lots of them in Hong Kong and lots of them in Europe. And then you ask yourself the question, you know, the, in, in, a multinational entity has multiple stakeholders and constituents and market forces operating on them in the global economy as well as opportunities. You can ask, well, if we have an employment problem or we have an income distribution problem, are our incentives and multinational corporations' incentives aligned? And the answer to that is they're not perfectly misaligned, but they're certainly not aligned. So if you ask the question, what is the incentive you know, for a multinational corporation to engage in an investment in technology that's designed to, make, to increase productivity in relatively high income environments for certain kinds of people and functions? And the answer is, if there's a several hundred million people, you know, still flowing into the global labor markets, the answer is the, the incentive isn't very high. But we can change that incentive if we think that's a reasonably efficient way, you know, of sort of, remember, we have an employment problem. It's roughly nine, let's call it a bigger number, 12%, right? What fraction of the global labor force is that? How much, if you, even if you think this is a zero-sum game, how much employment do you have to take back relative to the total? Our 12% is like, I don't know, 0.1% you know, of the relevant global labor force? Yeah, yeah. So, so if you shift the incentives a bit without really doing any harm to people, you know, you, can, you might be able to get some of this back. So part of a conversation you could have, again, this is policy the way it's done in the emerging economies, you know. We got a bit of a problem, careful. They got a bit of a problem, you know, you have to sort of experiment. This might not work, there's other ways to do it. Probably the most damaging way to do it is a fairly large, massive dose of protectionism. Wait, wait no, Kel, Ellen, I, I mean, I want to let other people in the conversation. However, let me qualify that. When, when our auto industry was threatened by Japanese imports in the late 1980s, does anybody remember what we did? Well, you're all too young. We imposed, we imposed quotas on them. Now, they were quotas in units, so Japanese were quite smart you know, started producing Lexuses instead of Corollas. So the awful lot of value per unit arrived. But after they'd run out that string, they started building plants in the south of the United States away from the unions. And I don't think anybody thinks that little act of protectionism that tipped the balance a bit in our favor again brought down the global economy. The problem is nobody knows where to draw the line. So this is dangerous stuff. You start doing that, and then you start getting retaliatory activity, and you can dismantle the whole thing. So it's delicate in that area. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But other thoughts? Yeah. Yes, sir. So when you think of the biggest challenge with uh, So I, to me, it, I divide it into two parts. I would say the, the, the immediate challenges, we call them short run, are uh, continuing to get inflation down, 
uh, you know, level off the asset, the real estate prices with a tanking them, the so-called soft versus hard landing. Um, dealing with the non-performing loans that were issued, which are pretty substantial, but they know how to do that. They did it before in you know 2000. You did it, uh, and um, and then and then there's. Uh, some concern about the off-balance sheet financing the municipal entities used, but that's been added up and and audited, and it's the aggregate sovereign debt still well under 50 percent of GDP. So I think it's um, competently handling the non-performing loans, um, administrative measures, and other things to bring inflation down, and reeling in the money supply and the credit, um, and then probably the hardest one is this sort of soft, but you know soft but not too soft landing on that on the real estate side and I'm betting they'll get that done and the evidence looks like it's running in that direction it'll be harder if the rest of the economy blows up the global economy because there'll be incentive to do sort of things that are unconventional and a little silly you know the so medium term agenda is is the 12 5 year plan so the way to think about that you can read you know read it it's a complex set of very well Put together moving parts. The, do it. Who was it? What's his name? The author of the 12 5 year plan is a man named Liu He. Liu He. Anyway, he's the, he's the vice minister and head of the leading group in economy and finance, and he basically, I mean, a bunch of people wrote the 12 5 year They wrote the proposal. This is esoterica for some of you, but, and then, and then it gets turned into an outline, and the National People's Congress passes the outline. Now, when I heard this, that's what happened in March. I heard this then, so now they've passed the outline. When are we going to see the proposal? People started laughing. They said, that is the proposal. I mean, that is, that is the plan, folks. <laughs> uh, bottom line, let me just be brief. I think this is well put together. It's complicated. It involves supply side and sub demand side structural change and the social and environmental and whatnot issues and social tensions and whatnot. But by and large, I think the resources are there to do it and the people know exactly what they're doing. So the question is, will it be implemented well? Because you've got to do all the pieces. But, you know, the demand side is really important. To, get, to start to move away from the investment-led growth model, especially if the investments are starting to show up as low return investments. And, and so they, that's perfectly well understood. You know, it's not that anybody's confused about that, but actually doing it, you know, dividending out state-owned enterprise income and deploying it for public purposes and letting it wind its way back to the household sector. They got a big tailwind from the rising wages in the coastal areas that started about 15 months ago. And they're really large increases. I mean, we're talking 20, 30% a year in uh, Pearl River Delta and so on. So that'll help enormously because it'll boost household income and you'll get this desired effect of driving both the growth and the composition of the economy on the supply side by domestic demand in part. Um, but I think there's some elements of resistance, and it's a pretty complex plan to implement. I, uh, I tend to be an optimist. You know, people who have been contrarians on China have bet against it every year for 31 years, and they lost money every single year. So it <laughs> doesn't seem to me a great time to bet against them now, but, uh, but you never know. There are conservatives who want to turn back the clock. And part of this transition is turning over more to the market and building the financial systems, um, savings options and intermediation capabilities up. So that's really important stuff. And, and it'll actually start to falter if it doesn't get done over time. And you know, Yu Yang Ding says a smart thing, which is the investment led model is a trap because investment generates aggregate demand and it's only later you've discovered because they were low return that you didn't get anything out of it other than that aggregate demand. And so, again, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody among the leadership is confused about that. But you can see why there might be under pressure, say we to take a downturn, to revert a little bit to the investment-led model as was done in the crisis. And I, I, I'm being a little flip. I mean, investment and other, like the export and the r urban, rural urban migration. But.
So I'm an optimist, bottom line, short term and, and implementation of the plan. Yes, sir. Going back to 1704, yes. uh, India and China were the, uh, I guess for a long time, the wealthiest countries, uh, accounting for maybe as much as a third of the foreign GDP. Yeah. And I'm quoting some of uh, uh, the Madison's papers. Yeah, I guess Madison says right now. So the question is, how are they, what links can you make with what's happening now? What happened before 1700, when they counted to the third of the total GDP, which now, they, I guess, we also did up until recently. Yeah, well, they're going to recover their position. It's the short version of it. It's 40% of the world's population if they have incomes like us. Eventually, they'll be the two economic giants in the global economy. And Well, we're going to have to get used to not being dominant. And they're going to have to be, play a constructive role in governing the global economy because they're going to be pretty big and powerful. When you said, you said something that's right, and it's consistent with that Angus Madison said, because they were large, you know, they actually had bigger economies than ours. It's also true that if you go back before the British Industrial Revolution, according to Angus's estimates, at least some of them, particularly China, was actually a higher income country by a small margin. But you realize that we're talking, even in, you know, if we use today's dollars, about economies where the per capita income was $300 and they might have been $350, okay, or $25 or something like that. That is, so there's, you can measure the wealth you know, or size of an economy by its aggregate size or do it per capita. And you get different answers. But, but you know, China was a big, important economy at, if you go back to the 16th century relative to others. What else do you have in mind? No, I see what you're getting at. No, I mean, I think, you, you know, these are, let me, let me take, it's very hard to discuss them all, so take the Chinese case. There, there are, there are legacy assets, you know, from the, the days of the uh, dynasties, right? Uh, an elite created by a meritocracy that's small, compact, and ran the place. Uh, over multiple dynasties. And they've essentially, in a way, retained that. I mean, that's how the place runs now. And, and the meritocracy is really important part of it. China, you know, th there's a belief in education that goes way, way back. Uh, it wasn't always delivered on, but China, China's literacy rates for men and women are over 90%. And that was true in 1978 when the economy was performing poorly. So when they decided to get rid of the destructive elements, they had an educated population that was ready, in some sense, to sort of enter the modern economy. Contrast that with India, which has lots of strengths and is doing just fine. Until recently, the literacy rate for women was under 50%, and not a whole lot higher for men. Now, that's a great big sea anchor to drag around, you know, in a modernization process, and they know it, so they're going to fix it over time. Uh, but there's so, and there's probably a whole lot more than that, but there's an ability to govern a sense of national identity that goes back 2,000 years. These are really important, sort of slightly hard things to get your hands on. One of the problems in Africa is when the colonial empires broke down, they created a bunch of countries that were not, that it made no sense economically. So a third of them are landlocked, if you've had Paul Collier here talking to you. 
so it's just rubbish from the point of view of economic design. But in addition, nobody in the country thought they were a citizen of a country. They thought they were a member of a tribe or something like that. And a generation of, you know, sometimes absolutely the greatest leaders we've had, like Nairari and Mandela, you know, created countries. You know, people who got up in the morning and thought, we're in this together, right? For better or worse and in the ups and downs. Kind of an important rock bottom base of how a society and an economy that's built on top of that society runs. China had already done that. I mean, there were flaws in it, and there were, you know, and there was a communist revolution that was egalitarian in spirit because that was not delivered. Uh, and it delivered land reform, you know. I mean, one of the ways to get highly concentrated ownership of all the, the country's assets is to take them all away. <laughs> so the state owns them. So in that sense, the history really matters, and it varies a lot across countries. And there's, and there's something that's even harder to talk about, is there's a sense of pride, which you pick up easily in these countries. Uh, in China, you know, we're, we had a pretty bad, China is the only country that we know of that experienced negative GDP growth for a whole century in the 19th century. And that was a source of lots of things, including anger, because that was, you know, external interference on the part of the British and then with a little help from us um, in, in the course of the middle part of that century. And so part of what's driving this is a sense that, you know, that was wrong and we're restoring our rightful place in the kind of global scheme of things. Indians are very proud of their democracy, which is a bit miraculous that it works. I mean, I, but it does. I mean, you know. It's, it's pretty amazing what's going on. I mean, if you stand back from this and don't get too fascinated by the problems and challenges that we have, which are real. I mean, we've got a very unstable global financial system and global economy right now that could break down badly. But over a longer perspective, you know, to take a world that has 15% of the people, you know, who are pretty confident they and their children have a future and move that number up to 85% is a pretty extraordinary thing. And it's never happened. Yes, ma'am. There's a new label in urban economies right now that are describing our attention after break, and they uh, call them myths. Uh, Mexico, Nigeria, Turkey, and uh, uh, in our tourist know what we think about that. Very optimistic. I mean, there's lots of work to do. Mexico was stumbling around for a long time, and that's clearly changing. I mean, there's lots of challenges, but in lots of parts of the country, so they've got to get the drug people out of control. But uh, you know, South Africa's a miracle in its own way, right? And, and South Africa has got resources, it's growing, uh, it feels pretty well put together. There's a massive inclusiveness problem in Latin America and much of Africa for similar reasons. I mean, it, South Africa was the extreme case of just age symmetries that were gross, you know, because of apartheid. But in Latin America and Africa, including South Africa, the Gini coefficients are just off the chart. Uh, and to the point where you'd think the whole systems would break down. You know what Gini coefficients are. They're standard measure of income inequality. And China's at 0.45. We're about 0.41. Almost everybody else in the advanced world is below that. 0.45 is the danger zone. And Brazil used to be at 0.61 and is coming down. And I think the message from that, and it's coming down in South Africa too, uh, is that if it's really bad, you can get away with it if it's going in the right direction. So the direction of movement and speed um, matter. In South Africa, the, the very big challenge is um, the educational deficiency left over from the apartheid era. There's just lots of, there's a huge shortage of teachers still and a, just a whole group of people that uh, deserve and need an education and it's a challenge to get there. They, but there's other issues. I mean, they have a dual labor market structure, you know, with very powerful unions and a formal sector, and then the other people who are, you know, this is worth paying attention to, you know, because it, it gets repeated in lots of countries, not just developing. So if you have these very powerful formal sectors, it, it's okay if everything's growing and there's an excess of aggregate demand for lots of different kinds of labor. But if, you, but if in, an, in a different kind of environment, if the young people get sort of hired in as transitional and easily expendable, 
and then you get a downturn of this type, they are expended. And so what you're hearing on the streets a lot is this system isn't right, but it's very difficult to break it, right? Because these entities are politically powerful. You see it in Italy, you see it in South Africa, you see it in a lot of different places. And we spent a fair amount of time on this in the Growth Commission. People say we need labor market reform. Sounds great, right? Uh, well, you go to do it and you say, you know, there's a lot of people who are sort of unemployed or often in these informal sectors. So you go to the formal sector and you say, we've got a great deal for you. We're going to open up the labor market and there's 30 million people who are going to compete for your job. What do you think of this proposal? And they think, I don't like it. <laughs> and then they don't do it. And it's just not, the, the frontal assault is, I think, not the right way to tackle that problem. You tackle it with excess demand if you can generate it and a dual structure where these other folks can get into the labor market. Um, and that takes real reform. A multinational coming in has to enter the formal labor market. Well, they look at the wage structures and say there's better places to go, so then they leave. Whereas if they could come in and employ the people who are underemployed in the informal sectors, if you could rig it up to, so they could get at that you know, labor force, then you could probably achieve a whole lot. So this is stuff that people are wrestling with all the time. But, but, that, but that set of countries you referred to, Turkey, Mexico, South Africa, um, are accelerating and generally not without problems, but in pretty good shape. And, and the growth of the major emerging markets is enormously important. China is the major export destination for India, Brazil, Korea, <coughs> soon to be Japan, Australia, and a very long list of countries. So the network structure of the global economy is just different than it was 15 years ago. And so if you ask any country where the risk factors lie, you know, they'll say us for sure, but they'll say China as well. If something goes wrong in China, that's a major, major problem now. Because it's big, second large economy in the world. If you don't count Europe as a unit, people differ on how to do that. One more question, yeah. What policies would you recommend for U.S. job creation based upon the success of Germans' policy implementation? And you also alluded to policies that the U.S. adopted in World War II. Yeah, so the, those policies created a very dynamic and sort of innovative, the, they, they created a a system that allowed the knowledge and technology base of the economy to evolve very rapidly. You know, through the things that you see all the time, through universities, the way they interact with uh, other parts of the economy, including businesses, startups, the financial industry, and so on. If you go to many countries, you know, you find that until recently, when, when they started to imitate our, quote, model, you know, the, there were boundaries. You know, the public, the universities are public employees. They have a kind of civil service mentality. You know, business is sort of dirty. That all of this kind of permeability that drives a lot of the dynamism here is missing in many countries, and they're they're recovering it now. So those are all strengths. I think you know, a, a multi-pronged attack for me would be. Um, Increased effort, and there's already a lot of effort on the effectiveness of the parts of the educational system that are not working very well for people. Um, a, a greater focus on skills, some attempt to focus technology investment with government participation, maybe public and private, on technologies that expand the employment opportunities for people. And I don't care where they are as long as they're interesting. Tradable, non-tradable, fine. I mean, you know, I don't think there's a rule. Uh, that says you have to do this. We need tax reform. We need immigration reform so that we make a sensible judgment, generous but sensible judgment about how many people we can absorb in various categories and actually generate employment for them. Uh, that's not an easy exercise to do, but we should do it. And we could sure use a sensible energy policy, which isn't just subsidizing things that might be viable sometime in the future. I don't really want to discuss Solyndra, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, our prices should be higher and they should be planned to go up as demand drives them up globally rather than just being hit by shocks. Now, if you did all that and ask people who are being honest, 
what fraction of the problem would you, how much more like Germany would you, you, you look? We don't exactly know, but we're probably a fair amount. And at least you're making the effort. I, I'd be the last person to say that globalization has no distributional effects. So if you define the problem as recovering a world that we had 25 years ago when these forces weren't operating on us quite the same way, I don't think that's probably realistic. At least on a before tax basis, we can redistribute income. Uh, but that's the direction I think the, the, the debate ought to occur. And I don't think the major problem right now is dancing on the head of a pin trying to get the fine-tuned right answer. I think the problem right now is it doesn't matter what, you know, 50 sensible people in this room could agree we ought to get started on, you know, to try to solve the problem. The problem is that a little bit south of us, they aren't doing it. Man, let me give you an example, and then I'll stop here because I'm going to run. We know there's infrastructure problems. I fly a lot back and forth from Europe on Lufthansa. Um, <laughs> I, I flew into Los Angeles. We landed early. There aren't enough jetways. Everybody knows this. So, I, you know, 40 minutes later, they pushed an Aeroflot plane off the jetway, and I don't know what happened to it. Probably went out in the Pacific and went down somewhere. But anyway, we got the jetway. We're late. We get off the airplane in a building that was built, was beautiful, it's the Bradley International Terminal, in 1984, built for the Olympics in Los Angeles. Jammed. There's a lot of nice people, you know, doing immigration, but there aren't enough places for them to work. So, you know, the lines, and the foreigners, are, it's unbelievably long, to the point where I have lots of friends in Asia and Europe who would rather not come here, you know, just cause on business, because of this experience. And then you get out of immigration eventually, depending on who you are, and you go into a customs hall where there's barely standing room. There isn't enough room to get the luggage out. And once you've got your luggage, or if you already had it with you, it takes 25 minutes in a line to hand a guy your customs declaration to get out of the building. So I did a calculation. I said, well, 10 flights a day at the peak points, 365 days a year with 300 persons of a flight per, per flight, probably replicated in 10 major you know, hub airports in America. Think of the productivity cost. But just the sheer lost time, not to mention people who think there's better places to do business. So I finally asked a friend. I said, what's going on? I mean, is it really true that a Los Angeles can't build, you know, or expand an airport? And he said, let me tell you what's going on. They know perfectly well what's going on in Los Angeles. They, 20 years ago, they allocated the money, you know, to continuously upgrade and expand the airport. The problem is that they have to change the boundary of the airport by about 100 meters in order to do this because they need runway space for A380s and other stuff. And they can't get through the regulations and the court proceedings to do it for 20 years. There was a plan created 20 years ago uh, in the early 90s to actually do this. And that's replicated all over our economy. So what I believe is true is that we talk a lot I said this publicly, Mohammed and Larry and I, we debate until, you know, everybody's almost dead from exhaustion. <laughs> what we need is a little more action, even if it isn't the whole solution. That's what I really believe. Now, how we get from where we are now, a debating society to somebody who, you know, a corporate-like thing where people say, debate's good. I'm listening to this. Excuse me. Oh. It's just my son. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm, go I'm blathering on. But I mean, I really think, you know, what happens in places that are successful is, you know, there's an ability, however acquired, in multiple different kinds of governance structure to have a de healthy debate. There's differences of opinion. There isn't a known right answer. But somebody calls a halt, blows a whistle, and says, now we're going to make a decision, not continue debating. This is what we need. Which, this is what we need to somehow, I don't know how to do it, recover. Yes, sir. Do you have historical examples of societies that could do that? Go from without chaos, go from a debate society to a social place that was Well, China does it, but a better example is India. Yes. India is a good example. 
India has a 12, I mean, has a, is building the 12 five-year plan, has a, a five-year plan. It has governments that come and go, but they don't change the fundamental growth agenda. And if they did, they'd get immediately voted out of office by the people and the other one put back in because the people don't want them to change the game plan too much. No, there's lots of messiness around there, but there's a coherence to it and stuff gets done, you know, with admittedly limited resources. So it's not, it's not impossible, but there is a, a growing pattern of apparent something. I don't, we call it gridlock frequently here, but, you know, it has different forms in different countries and we're not certainly unique in this respect. And I don't think I'd put myself up as having the answers. But there, so the way Mohammed and I described it is that you, what we learn from the emerging economies is that you act and learn versus debate and wait. And I think there's some, I mean, it's a little cute, but I think there's some truth to it. Anyway, thank you very much. Everybody.